everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jill Hurston. I'm with marketing at CenterZip Prime. Uh, we're very happy to have you join us today from whatever time zone you're in. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, our topic is technology roadmap acceleration with remote teams. We thought this would be a pretty appropriate topic because if 2020 taught us anything, it is that remote workers are pretty much the new normal. Uh, we also learned that remote teams can be effective and sometimes even more effective than the traditional in-office or co-located teams. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss practical advice on effectively using remote teams of software professionals. While we will cover some general considerations that are geography agnostic, some of this will also focus on our firsthand experience with effectively le leveraging software talent, mostly in India. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. We have Kelly Steven, who is a consultant, and Hemet Elhens, who is president of Sinners at Prime. Kelly, would you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little about, about yourself? Sure, Jill, and thank you very much, and uh, happy to be here. Um, hope I get a lot out of this today. I hope you all have a lot of questions for us and, and input. Uh, my name is Kelly Steven. I'm a consultant who, uh, working in the technology area. I work primarily with software companies and technology organizations to help them do a better job of uh, improving their delivery and their quality and their execution to make sure that they're meeting or exceeding their customer expectations. And prior to that, I, I worked a plus 20 plus years in software uh, companies, uh, primarily in the role of vice president of product development or and, and or product management, doing a lot of work in a variety of different industries. So. Um, that's me, and uh, I'll, uh, Hemet, why don't you uh, introduce yourself as well? That's good. Thank you, Kelly. So in my case, um, I'm Hemant Alhens. I've been on both sides um, of software development or multiple sides of software development, helping companies leverage remote talent pool and doing that for about 20 years or so. And But I've been on the other side of building software and being a client, leverage remote talent pool myself. And then, of course, being a developer and management consultant and many other roles in the middle of that I've played. So I've seen software from many different angles. So happy to get share our perspective between Kelly and I. We should be able to provide good perspective on how to really get good value and how to get make it successful in leveraging remote talent pool that all of you have become so probably quickly familiar with. So let's talk about this topic and we'll keep it conversational. Kelly and I will kind of go back and forth on these pages and hopefully take any questions you guys may have on this topic. So the first thing to kind of reconcile and, and recognize this, um, you know, we were all talking about uh, and clients were talking about leveraging remote talent pool pre-COVID days, right? I mean, there were the reasons for lack of local talent availability, whether you are in San Jose, California, or Austin, Texas, or wherever you were, it was always hard to find talent. So that was one reason. Of course, then there were reasons related to budget. You know, it is often cheaper to find talent uh, offshore and so on. So that was another reason even before COVID times. And another one was time zones. Sometimes if you need to provide 24 by seven coverage for your clients, and you need a US nighttime coverage, it is you're sometimes better off finding a remote talent in, in a time zone that allows you to cover US nighttime. And then of course, as cloud came about in last you know, several years, it became so much easier to just leverage uh, remote development. Now, all that was anyways happening as we all recognize. And then suddenly last year, all of us were pushed in a hurry to start doing remote development within a week, within, in fact, we are not far from a year from that second week or so of March. We were all pushed almost overnight within a week to start. And once you start doing effectively remote software development, as we were pushed in March last year, you start questioning, why do you have to be in the office in the first place and so on. So I think the remote development has become a sudden reality for sure, uh, more so than it was pre-COVID. And now it is almost a necessity for tech companies to deliver to their clients effectively. So that's the kind of a backdrop for why we are taking the time today to share the topics. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to kind of set the stage. These are the five topics we'll cover today in our discussion. Um, the first one provides some context to the current climate for remote. Uh, then we'll talk about geography options. 
then we'll talk about uh, how to get started what works well then we'll talk about uh, you know how to leverage partners to make it work even better and then of course some of the core ideas to make it a success in the long run so with that over to you kelly thanks Hemet. um i appreciate that and uh, just for context wise and you uh, what i really want to emphasize here we're going to focus primarily on given my background and, and Hemet's background and, and his companies that he deals with on uh, technology companies and organizations um we're not really going to i mean the, the gamut of covid impacts uh, obviously is a lot wider than that uh, from retail to uh, small businesses brick and mortar um, restaurants gyms etc a whole different slew of and quite frankly i'm not an expert in in, in their their issues that's not uh, who i am and that's not who i deal with on a regular basis and it's it's a shame a lot of them went out but we're going to focus on the technology organizations um we really look at there was two types of companies some that companies already uh, supported remote workers in one ver one way or another some had some remote workers some had multiple locations across the us or globally others had no remote locations and and the impact of both was was quite extensive and, and you know similar but different as well and all companies at that point you know again back to last march um, had to invest at some level in a variety of things, personal equipment, laptops, and docking stations. One of my clients is a very large client, about a you know six plus billion dollar in revenue annually. They actually, in one day in March, put an order in for 1,500 laptops. Now they had already had some remote people, and they'd already converted most of their staff to laptops anyway. But they had a number of people who came in the office every day who were working with you know traditional PCs. So they had to now equip those. So they could afford it from a, a you know um, uh, an earning standpoint. You know it's not a six plus billion dollars it's not a big hit financially but think of the the cash outlay that went out you know from that aspect pretty significant um everybody had to focus on increased security and and some didn't initially and got burned by it as well but whether that's a, a two-factor authentication um various software widgets to, to connect um vpns etc um, a lot of uh, people were forced with increased network bandwidth and so not only internally within the company itself but oftentimes uh, personally now you know, most of, you know, even if, if their people had remote access and, and an internet hookup at home, which, you know, most people do today, especially in, if, in the technology organization, was it sufficient to work all day and all long? Plus, now with one person at home, um, now maybe there's two, maybe there's a spouse um, as well. And so it really got to the situation where, oh my gosh. And then you, you talk about the type of collaboration software. Again, some people who are already using remote capabilities, um, they already were using some form of collaboration software, but now uh, a lot of people had to you know, jump in with both feet to try to figure out how to make this work. Uh, video conferencing platforms, you know, we'll talk a little bit that, about that later as well, but my gosh, the, the acceleration of use of video um, was good because then you have the personal connectivity with people, but also you could also look at a situation where you're using more bandwidth as well, which is uh, uh, as we talked about. Um, and then lastly, it's not just the equipment and the tools, but also the processes that you have as well. You have to be um, really, you have to create more of an environment that's a, a lot more um, friendly to using remote workers, different timeframes. You know, some people had kids at home, some people had different, you know, um, babysitting uh, situations and the like. So people really had to work with off hours, different hours, and, and really adapt to the changing workforce. So really interesting. Um, if we look at a year later, I think what I would see and what I've seen in, in the folks I talk to, the majority of technology companies and organizations have adapted very well. I think from, from that aspect, I think that's to be expected. Um, and, and even although some of them may have had a short, uh, you know, a, a long runway, um, they, once they figured it out, it was pretty good. Um, the security and infrastructure, equipment, all the processes in place um, to work more seamlessly as they did before. Now, they missed the interaction, you know, walking around the office and seeing people, going out to lunch with people. Um, but at least they, they, you know, most companies that, again, that I've talked to, all the companies I've talked to have adapted very well from that aspect. And, and what's interesting as well, workers and organizations have become more comfortable working in a remote environment. Um, and that, that to me is interesting as I've, I've done that a lot myself in the past, but I always enjoy interacting with people. And even as a consultant, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here working out of my home office now for, for quite a while. But oftentimes, you know, once or twice a week, I'd go have coffee or lunch with somebody um, just to have that connectivity with people as I work with people all over the country. So it's, it's interesting how, you know, that affects people, but people have adapted very well. And I think that's a big plus for us uh, as far as our adaptability um, to changing environments. <clears throat> so how's it going to affect us in the future? You know, I, I look at a lot of different things, um, you know, 
a lot of large companies have announced a permanent remote workforce going forward. I know, you know, Facebook did that, Google did that, a lot of the larger and smaller companies. So if I look at that, you know, it's, it's kind of an impact. I have a personal impact on that. Uh, my older, older sister um, recently retired. In fact, last week was her last uh, day of work, her and her husband both. And their plan uh, for the last five, six years has been to move to Hawaii. Uh, they live in California uh, to actually buy a house on the big island, which was, was somewhat affordable and uh, just live their retirement years out there. They have a, one of my niece lives out there and, and they were going to live close to her. In the last year, the, the market has gone crazy in Hawaii, what, where there were once affordable houses in the Big Island, there aren't anymore. And they weren't going to get a huge mansion or anything like that. It's just more of everybody who can work remotely. I can work remotely in Sacramento or I could work remotely in Hawaii, you know, and it becomes a, a little more dichotomy. So the, their, their market, we've seen that in other areas of the country as well. Um, there's going to be an there is an impact on commercial real estate, but it's going to get, you know, more as well. Um, from that aspect, you have a lot of offices that are, you know, going to, when the leases expire with a lot of these companies, they're probably not going to up them, or if they do up them, they're going to get, you know, smaller space for maybe conferences or conference rooms, et cetera, to have, you know, group meetings and the like, now that people are used to working from home. It's going to impact on personal real estate and living accommodations. Um, I was talking to one, uh, one of my friends who bought a new house, and it just so happens right before COVID hit, he bought a house that had a, 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 a garage with an apartment overhead. That's now his office. And he, he's in the financial industry. He was going into a bank every day. Now he has to work mainly from home, but they were lucky enough the house that they just bought had that. But now, you know, what happens with a, you know, two spouses at home and a two bedroom apartment with a kid? And now where's the space? And how do you, how do you accommodate that within there? It's going to be really interesting how that changed the dynamics of uh, real estate and personal living accommodations going forward. Um, what will happen? You know, will companies start uh, offering incentives for people to, you know, to do some stuff at home to have a better work in, in environment, maybe close off a bedroom, split a bedroom, you know, something like that, convert a garage to have a workspace. Because if you look at the money that companies are going to start saving on commercial real estate, potentially, as they, they short, you know, lower their footprint or reduce their footprint, you know, will they spend that to have a more robust work environment for remote people as well? And, you know, what I found is, too, is um, the thing that I miss is I talked about just you know, going out to lunch with folks or just meeting them in the hallway. You know, figuring out ways to um, increase teamwork and camaraderie for remote workers, you know, figure out how to do one of my clients is doing um, virtual happy hours. They're still doing lunch and learns and they're sending people you know, like a Panera gift card if that's where they have, you know, if they have a Panera near their house or a Jimmy John's or something like that, where at least they can go ahead and have lunch brought in um, individually for all these people. You know, that's a that's a one way to do it, to keep that esprit de corps up. Um, and also the fact that you've done this, the changes in processes, equipment, infrastructure, now companies are have a remote workforce, they have the ability to expand their workforce. Now, um, in a lot of cases, geographically, one of my clients right now, they're headquartered in the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania. You know, technology workers in that area, there's plenty of them, but now they have the ability as we're recruiting new people for them to widen the net quite a bit. You, you don't have to be in that area. I'm, I'm working with them all the time and I'm on, in California myself. So I'm, I have 5.30 a.m. calls, but that's okay. You know, and that's, that's how it works. And uh, you, know, you have the ability now to widen the net. You can get a different level of talent. Some cases, uh, a different cost of talent. You know, people in Southern California or the Bay Area now may be a little more um, apt to get people in the Midwest or in, in like the Plain States who have technology leader, technology skills but the, the office and the works aren't, work isn't out there. Now they can get a job at some of these other companies as well. So that's going to be a, a pretty interesting dynamic as we go forward as well. And with that, um, I'm going to uh, hand it off now. So now, now. Now that we've set the stage here with a year of COVID where people and companies are used to working remotely, um, what does that do? And I just talked about expanding the, the opportunity for you know, staff to, to widen that net a little bit. You also now have, you know, the skill set and the, and the tools and the techniques and the processes down to widen that even further. So you have other geographic options that companies can dip, uh, can, can look into. So, uh, Hammond, I'm going to pass it off to you to, to talk about this next piece. Sounds good. Thank you, Kelly. So, as Kelly said, now that this has become a new normal, almost a default setting for most tech companies that, you know, remote workforce is pretty much, thanks to COVID, um, become the, you know, just acceptable and, and almost a expected kind of a arrangement. The question is what geographies, if you are thinking of leveraging the remote talent pool, how do you think about 
the common geography that are available for good reason. So here's a very simple kind of a summary viewpoint. We're not going to do justice in this webinar to all the regions and go into details, but this is a good first pass of, you know, there's this in terms for software talent, there's plenty of good software talent around the world, whether you're in Austin, Texas, or San Jose, California, or you know Bangalore, India, or uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, wherever you, there's good talent everywhere in the world. And we just have to recognize that reality. But for you, who wherever you are located as a company, for you to consider remote talent pool, I mean, these are four kind of criteria that we think are important when you come when it comes to software development the first criteria of course is the time zone difference right i mean for you to collaborate following good agile practices it's an important criteria to consider where you're going to locate or where you will accept having some of your talent pool remote so time zone is one second is the quality of talent pool availability third is the scale at which you need the talent pool and then fourth is of course economics and so let's so We've taken just three kind of regions here to give a broad brush kind of perspective on this. So South slash Central America for time zone, it's pretty convenient. I mean, it's uh, right now I'm sitting here in Dallas, Texas. So within a couple of hours of difference, whether you are in Mexico or, you know, uh, Sao Paulo or wherever you want to talent pool, you know, within a couple of hours, you can get the overlap or time zone difference. You can have plenty of overlap therefore. If you're Eastern Europe, let's go row by row, so I'll cover each region that way. If you're in Eastern Europe, chances are you're probably six-ish hours, give or take, kind of a difference of time zone. So you still get, in terms of your usual work day, you'll still get comfortably half a day or so of overlap, which is pretty valuable. In the case of South Central America, you get pretty much most of the day of overlap. In Eastern Europe, you will have probably half a day or so. When it gets to India or Indian subcontinent in general, you got you are 11 and a half hours away uh, time zone. India is 11 uh, with daylight savings like currently from central time zone, it's 10 and a half hours away, but you know, round numbers 11-ish, let's say. So you almost a day and night difference. That's a big challenge in terms of collaboration with that geography, but you know, it's a trade-off. Then the second criteria is availability of talent and you see pluses on all three. And, and our viewpoint is look, you got good if you, have the right kind of partner and right form of attracting talent, you got good talent everywhere. Lack of talent is not an issue in any region. I would not say that, you know, uh, Eastern Europe has better talent or India has better talent. All of them have. They all have really good talent, no issues there. So they're all at par, in my opinion, on the talent quality. Then it comes to the talent scale, which is how big a team do you need eventually? If you need a team of less than 10 people, you know, a scrum team or so, give or take, then I think South, America, South Central America or Eastern Europe, Europe, those regions are just perfect. You know, uh, the talent pool is not huge, but you get good quality, the overlap is good. And for small team sizes, there's absolutely no issue from what I've observed. But if you need a much bigger team, if your roadmap and requirement is that you expect to get to, you know, let's just use a number 50 or so uh, software person team, then I think, India is better in terms of scale. You can get talent quality and scale there. So that's one plus point for India while the time zone is a challenge. Uh, then the fourth key consideration is the economics, the cost. And just if you normalize to the US cost of a dollar and just think of an average load, fully loaded cost for the year for a mid-level software professional, if you think of US as one on that normalized scale, South Central America is probably 70 cents, roughly, you know, depending on which specific region, but fully loaded cost if you do apples to apples comparison. Eastern Europe is a little north of that, uh, but still, um, you know, not too far off from 80 cents or so. India is probably 40 cents, sometimes 50 cents, somewhere in that range. So that's the basic economics we see day in, day out. For India, of course, most of my first-hand experiences with India-based teams, so I am intimately familiar with that. But that's essentially the trade-off as you think about remote teams around the world. So with that, let's talk about the, the next part of the challenge, which is how do you get started? Let's say you pick a region for the reasons that I laid out or whatever reasons you have. And but how do you get started in a way that you have less chances of derailing your initial team? Or so increasing the odds of success, that's important. 
So our observation is that longer term, meaning once you have the foundation established of a remote team, you have a critical mass, you got the processes defined, you got the trust foundation built with the remote set of professionals you have now put together, you can do pretty much anything with the remote team. And whether the remote team is in Eastern Europe or India or Guadalajara, Mexico, doesn't matter. Once you have a trusted foundation, you can do any kind of work support, new architecture, ongoing development, what have you. UX design, doesn't matter. You can do pretty much any kind of work, frankly, because the talent pool is good everywhere. But the challenge is how do you get that foundation? So in the short term, while you're building the foundation of your remote team, and I use zero to six months, that's the amount of time it takes to get a really good solid foundation of a remote team. How do, what criteria should you use to get that foundation established right? So here are the four criteria we have observed work really well to get started with a remote team and have higher chances of success. So I call it a what project you should pick essentially think of it that way, which what initial project you should pick as you're thinking about it. So the first criteria is pick a project that drives real business value to you. And the reason this is important is because you're doing this experiment with a remote team in this scenario, and you want to be able to convince your peer management, your investors, and you know your team in-house that you know why this is a good idea. And if you pick something which has a real business value, it allows you to show business value more easily. So pick something that, that matters and you can deliver business value within you know, six-ish months or so. So pick, pick a project, whatever it is, new product or feature in a new product or uh, whatever the pro technology project backlog you may have, but pick one that has a real dis business value. The second criteria I would suggest we should pick is some pick something initially which is reasonably well-defined. And I'll go into more detail of this one because when you have a new remote team that we're talking here about, they don't understand your business context fully yet. They probably don't understand your technology stack fully yet. They probably don't yet have a good working relationship with your in-house team and your processes and all that. So there are a lot of uh, things that need to get ironed out. So it's better to start with a project that is reasonably well-defined so it is less likely to have any kind of a misunderstanding of scope and all that stuff. And third is pick a project, and I'm, we're talking a software development kind of a backlog items, pick something that lend itself well for distributed software development, meaning a team sitting far away should be able to do full end-to-end -end development and test it, and you shouldn't have the constant issue, oh, it works on my machine, but it doesn't work on your machine uh, locally here. So make sure you pick something that indeed is suitable for distribute software development. And fourth point is pick something which you actually have a local champion who is willing to work out any kinks in the process and make it a success. And we'll cover a little more detail of each of these um, point number two, three, and four. Uh, Excuse so me, Hamid. Say, yeah. Hamid, I got a quick question that's come in. Um, when you talk about having, you know, starting a short-term project from zero to six months, what size of a team are you talking about? Yeah, so our general observation is that the minimum team size, if you're gonna have a remote team that should behave like a team remotely. So an ideal, of course, starting team should be a full scrum team, which is you know, roughly seven plus minus two. So you may have four developer, two QA, product owner, DevOps, UX, well, this brings you to a somewhere in the seven plus minus two range. So that's an ideal. But even if your initial project wasn't big enough to justify that or your budget wasn't big enough to justify that, the minimum I would suggest, Jill, to your question is at least three. Let's say two developer and one QA person. The magic number three is very important for a remote team because a three-person team can actually behave like a team. There's enough of a team dynamic and they can collaborate with each other in their local time zone. Remember, these are all remote people and all that. So I think three is the minimum, seven plus minus two, a typical scrum team is that is typical way to get started. And then of course you can make any multiples of it as you scale your scope of work that you do remotely. Right, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the, how do you pick a well-defined project? So software, so when you, have, when you start a remote team, one of the biggest challenges is this one, which is for a remote team, how do they understand 
the intent of what you want to build. And this is from my cone about the challenge of software requirement. This is essentially, you have to make a bridge between the people who are like your product manager and product owner in your local office here and the development team and the QA team, which is remote, they have to understand your intent. And uh, while the time zone difference and all that is what it is, how do you communicate the intent clearly enough that a remote team can be successful and build what you want them to build? So that's the challenge. So it is almost so the, so I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail of what we have observed, how it works well, uh, what you do to make it work well. But the nature of the challenge is essentially like you asking a remote team, make me a pizza. Right now, it's one thing to say to a remote team, make me a pizza and deliver, you know, whatever, next print or something like that, right? But I think you've got to be clear. You mean what size of pizza do you mean? Is a pie eight inches or, you know, 24 inch to pie? What size is the pie? What kind of crust you got, you're, you're expecting to have on it? What kind of sauce? What kind of toppings? So from a eight inch cheese pizza to a, you know, 18 inch, you know, with, uh, olive and green pepper and onions and all that. I mean, they're two, two very different pizzas. So you got to be clear on being very specific and, uh, and detailed in some cases about what requirements you want the remote team to build. And there, therein lies the biggest challenge, actually. So here's a way we have found to organize and understand your nature of requirements challenges for the remote team. When you, and then again, remember, remember, this is all very important when you're starting out. So first assess the Y dimension is have a good understanding or good kind of a calibration of the domain familiarity of a remote team. How familiar are, are they sitting you know, whatever 11 hours time zone away in the different business and, and social context of understanding your industry domain that you are building your product for. And then the horizontal, the X axis is your local product management and product owner team, how uh, ready are they in terms of providing granular detail requirement? And the and the axis here is all the way to the right where the, all the, you are able to provide to the remote team is a high level vision, right? You can maybe half a page word document or one page or two page word document, you're providing a vision versus all the way to the left on the scale where you're able to provide a behavior driven development or acceptance test driven development kind of a acceptance test, which is you know as granular as it gets in software development or somewhere in the middle. So calibrate yourself, where do you stand in with your team on this dimension? Let's take some examples to illustrate this challenge. So on the Y axis, the domain familiarity, let's say you're building a software application to address some of the use cases related to your local US pharmacy workflow, right? Now, if you have a team in India, the pharmacy, workflow is very different for a developer sitting in India who grew up in India versus a pharmacy workflow that you are used to seeing if you go to a Walgreens or a CVS in US. It's a world of a difference, right? So the business context is very different for a developer sitting in India. It will be have, difficult for them to understand that uh, domain. So that's one sort of extreme end of it. In the middle, if you're building an online auction platform, you know, eBay style, yeah, if someone sitting in India could still, right, because they're familiar with eBay and other such auction platform these days, it's probably not that hard for them to understand that domain and become familiar and be able to interpret your requirements, context and all that. And of course, the easiest and most familiar domain as an example is if you're building a, a new mobile email client for whatever reason, everybody uses email, all developers and test QA people, are everybody uses email, so they know what a email use cases look like, what features they need to have and all that. So it's a very familiar domain for a remote team. So that's one way to think about it, which is the wide axis, which is how familiar your remote team is on the, on the domain. And then your own in-house team, you know the answer. You know, if, you, if you're very disciplined about having user ex stories with clear acceptance criteria, great. Then you are on the left side of the horizontal axis, X axis. If all you're able to provide is high level epics, then you're on the right hand side. So your risk essentially is highest when your remote team is uh, is working in a domain which is very unfamiliar to them, like a US pharmacy system kind of a uh, software domain. And you're all you're able to provide are epics or high level vision, then you are running a high risk, you have to be careful. So just pick a project essentially, where you are closer 
to the left bottom left if possible and if you're on the right then make sure you are able to provide you know sufficient uh, kind of support to the team all right so that's the first uh, kind of a criteria second is pick a project that lends itself itself for distributed development so make sure you know all the development test environment is easily accessible either they can have it a local environment for them to do in whatever time zone they are in or everything is on the cloud including the you know issue tracking system and and all that stuff so these days with cloud this topic has become easier and easier but you still have to make sure you're not asking a remote team to build a feature or a product where they're dependent on needing access to a backend data source of some sort which is not accessible to them uh, easily and therefore they are not able to do end-to-end -end testing and all that then you will run into the constant issue that it works on my machine and you'll always struggle with them it doesn't work on your machine and all that so make sure whatever you're building lend itself for distributed development and of course the third criteria is have a local champion there will be unknowns for the remote team to start becoming productive so make sure you have someone locally who's enthusiastic and and frankly incentivized to make this success because it's very easy for a software development project to fail and not deliver on time on quality on scope so you need a champion who can help remove any roadblocks any issues related to you know requirements clarification and all that and more importantly make sure they're not insecure about their job with because of the remote team and all that so so that those are the kind of a main criteria and uh, with that let me turn it over back to kelly to give another perspective from the consulting side thanks Hamid. um yeah why don't we go to the next slide here one of the things as we look at this um there's uh, some options that you have right now that you are you and your organization are used to using um re having remote workers um, there's some other things that you can do and Hema just walked through a lot of reasons and a lot of opportunities you have to further expand your team if ne needed by going um, to outside or offshore organizations or offside offshore teams let me say that but within that you have the actually the, the capability to do one of two things or one, multiple things really but you could either um, partner with somebody or you could build your own team and and I've worked with organizations who have done both and there's pros and cons both way if you're going to build your own team like set up a, you know, if, if you're a large enough organization, you can set up a, a company um, in, in somewhere in Eastern Europe, somewhere in India, somewhere down in Mexico or uh, South America, it doesn't really matter. You have to figure out what geography works for you, but um, you can do that, but you gotta have critical mass to do that. Uh, building your own team gives you a lot more control of the situation, but it also requires you to do a lot more work. Um, using a partner allows you to focus on your team and just the work that you have to them to do, and the partner handles the rest. And by that, I mean, for example, you have a situation where if you start your own organization, you have to worry about real estate in, in some foreign land. You have to worry about having a, a leadership there, financial team there, um, HR team there, and the like, and building out the, the, the corporate infrastructure that you need to properly support the workers that you really need for whatever you're doing. Like if you really need um, a customer service organization or you really need a development organization or both, you also need all the peripherals around that organizationally to proper support them as a team, even though they may be even in their countries working remotely as well. So keep that in mind. Um, and then model your investment to actually cover all the true costs. That's a, it's a big thing. So there might be some other uh, tax implications for you. There might be transfer pricing um, issues as well. So keep that in mind when, when you're working on building out your team and, and your options there that you have, whether building or, or, or you know, using a, a partner to do that. Um, the next component of that, uh, again, on partner versus build your own, um, it's time to value. A lot of situations where you know, building your own team is gonna take time, up to, you know, if they're gonna work remotely or are you gonna have an office, you have to set all that up. You have to get the HR people, start recruiting and getting all that. Um, how fast do you need to be up and running? Is it a short-term project that is really underwater that you need help with? You might wanna go partner with somebody. And one thing I've, I've had people do in the past, companies do in the past, they start out partnering with an organization and then find that, hey, they, they, they get the remote um, working, they get working with offshore and they want a larger team and a large organization and they can build out their own team at that point. That's obviously kind of a hybrid approach that you could take as well going forward. But really, if, if you're gonna start from the ground up, you gotta assume it's gonna take six months to get that team up and running with all the infrastructure components that you have uh, required there. 
in some cases, a partner could get you a team up and running in, in within a few weeks. So keep that in mind as you go forward. A big thing for me is, is uh, focus. And I, I talk about this not only with working with remote teams, but just organizations. And a lot of the organizations I go into have some issues, as we talked about, with delivering quality or delivering timely releases. And invariably, what I find, um, among other issues that the organization may have, a, a lot of times it's a, a, a problem of focus. And, and really what I'm talking about there is prioritization. And do what you do well and focus on the things that are really going to move the needle for your customers. That's very critical for any organization, and I feel very strongly about that. Um, sometimes you have, you know, 25 things. On, and first company I went to work for, actually, they had 19 priority critical projects they had to get done. And I looked at the guy and said, there's no a well-oiled machine that, that, that's your size to get 19 critical projects done. So let's focus on the ones that really need to get done now and just prioritize those over the others. And we did that very successfully. Uh, but same thing with, with um, a, an offshore team. If you have an offshore team, it's gonna be a distraction. And not. I just wanna be clear, it's not a bad distraction, but it is something that's gonna take time away from other things that you do. If you're stretched thin in the financial organization or your HR organization or your, your PMO, for example, and, and you have start you know having to have the, build the same infrastructure somewhere else, that becomes a management burden for you to, to handle as well. So keep that in mind as well. If it's going to distract you, then you don't want to go build your own. If it's going to um, in, enable you, then you do want to do your own. So keep that in mind as you go forward. And a lot of times, again, a partnering with somebody can eliminate some of that distraction because they're going to take care of the the, the, the care and feeding of the workers and the organization, you're just going to focus on your team and what they need to do to get done for your projects. One other thing uh, that I've noticed, and, and I've worked with organizations in, in Europe and India primarily, um, not so much down in South America or, or Mexico, but um, uh, attracting and retaining talent is hard, um, especially in some of the larger tech centers in India. Um, you know, you have, you're competing now with some of the big um, U.S.-based companies, Microsoft, Google's, you know, you name it, you know, they have uh, worldwide organizations a lot of times, same with China as well. And so, you know, you're going to go out there with your um, XYZ company and say, hey, we're going to retire, you know, we, we want to hire some new people and they may not even know you. You may be a U.S. only based company that has no global presence whatsoever. So, um, you know, then hiring those people, people coming into your organization really don't know what you do. And in some cases, I worked with insurance companies in the past and building software for um um, um, insurance industry, let me say, building software to support like the automotive insurance industry, for example, and, and collision estimating specifically and, and repairs. Um, if you look at how other organizations, um, other countries do that, England, for example, they do things completely differently than how I do, we do it here. So explaining to a tech person over there how we do things and why they do it, it's, it's you know, it's, pardon the pun, but it's foreign to them, just conceptually, they don't understand why we need to do that and, and you know, why we're doing what we do because they don't have the same thing. So keep that in mind as well. But a lot of it too is retaining talent and, and you know, go into organizations and find out what their retention period is. And what I've found as well, you know, both on, you know, in, in within the U S and also abroad is it all comes down to leadership, you know, having strong leadership, strong communication, strong esprit de corps. That's something that you really need to build and you really need to nurture. So getting that good local leadership. And, and if you're going to partner, you know, make sure that you're talking to people over there uh, before you sign up with somebody to make sure that they understand, you know, you understand how good an organization it is over there and what's it thought of. Ask for their um, turnover rates, you know, and they, they'll they'll give them to you, you know, and, and you trust them. But that's really a key thing for uh, people as well. They want to make sure that you want to make sure that you have a team. If you're going to have a team, whether it's a, to Hemet's point, you know, a seven per, plus or minus two, or you have multiple teams over there, whether it's in Europe or anywhere, you want to make sure that there's some consistency there because if you have to retrain folks all the time, it's going to take time away from their being productive as well. And, and last, I did the, the next slide. Hemet talks about the uh, leadership as well, and I mentioned that. But what I found as well, um, I had one organization I was in when I was an employee. I, we were about a $50 million business, um, which isn't big, but it's not small either, you know, but we were worldwide and probably too small to be have a worldwide development team. But our India, uh, our, we had a development team and a support team in India. And the GM of that um, office was uh, one of the best leaders I've ever um, worked with, uh, ever, ever had the pleasure of working with. He was great. Um, that team, I went over there several times and they, the, you know, everybody worked well together and everybody worked very hard. They're very proud of the work they did. He made it really clear what the business needs were for them. 
and what um, how the you know what they did made an impact on the business, but also more importantly, what they how what they did made an impact on our customers as well. And um, that was a you could tell it as you walked in the place. I mean, the first time I went in there, I had a team of about 20 people, and they each went through about a 20 to 30 minute PowerPoint presentation. Took two days of who they were, what they did, what their likes and dislikes were. So I knew everybody in that organization. It was well, it was time well spent. You know, the two weeks first, the first time I went, the two weeks I was there, the first two days we went through that. But that was the type of leadership you need. And you find a company that does that, or you got to build it yourself. But make sure you do that because that's going to um, be probably your biggest opportunity for success um, wherever you go. Um, okay, now I think uh, the next piece, Hemet, you're going to dive into a couple things and I'll come back as well. But we're going to talk now about um, what are the, some of the best practices that we need. And, and Hemet has talked about some of those I have as well, but we're going to kind of tie it together here um, toward the end. So Hemet, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Kelly. So yeah, so these are this is a section where we now that you, you picked a geography that works for you, you got started and uh, you you decided whether you're going to do it captive or uh, your own or partner with someone so you covered all that ground now the section is you know let's talk some long-term kind of success ideas that we have seen work really well and and kelly and i will go back and forth the first is maintain the mindset of a collaborative partnership whether it's your own team that you set up shop in bangalore or guadalajara mexico wherever you are or you have a partner company either way for software development is important you follow good agile collaborative kind of a partnership you know tailor agile for your situation we all know agile works generally well but you, but you can customize and tailor it for your situation uh, two week iteration is a good idea when you have remote teams um, it's big and long enough for team to run hard and deliver and feedback is very important and on feedback make sure you do retrospectives remote respect retrospectives work quite well over zoom and and google meet no issues just use those techniques in fact they sometimes work even better uh, for a variety of reasons as things start humming along post covid of course travel becomes very valuable so we highly encourage travel back and forth you know maybe a couple times a year you don't have to be doing it every quarter but it is important to have a remote team member visit you here or someone from this side visit the remote team wherever they are and you know that's usually for the india travel we find you know someone visiting from india four weeks or so these for that seems like a long time now uh, is is a good duration but if you're visiting from us to india one week is pretty good you can get a pretty good feel for the team and spend a week working with them and and getting to know them so but travel back and forth is very valuable certainly encourage ongoing collaboration of course that has become a norm now with video and audio and, and and instant messaging and all of those and then certainly invest in tooling to allow remote development to work really well and those things have become such a default state right now that um, not doing them is no good reason for another principle um, to apply. Hamid, before you move on i know we have been getting some questions on what are the good collaborative collaboration tools i think kelly are you going to cover that in a little bit right so just keep yeah, that some in mind. Of, i think we could address it now i talked more about the communication aspect i think you know from that hammett um what we found is that uh you know having a, a good source code control from a software standpoint is obviously critical but not just that um also uh, a good uh good tool for user stories whether it's jira or um there's a number of other um, um tools out there as well um, there's a lot of people using Slack for collaboration and, and document sharing, but you know that's one of the things these a lot of organizations in the last year have done a great job of adding um, sharing capability within their their applications. So um, Hemet, like Teams, for example, I, I, I can't tell you how impressed I was with Microsoft, who hasn't always moved very quickly in the past, mm -hmm. and how much money and functionality they've the money they've invested in functionality they've added to Teams which you know, a year ago wasn't really that great of a platform, but it's actually pretty solid right now. So um, Hemet, I don't know if you have some other ideas as well. No, I think these are all good ones. Um, and the new tools keep coming up. Uh, these days it becomes such a fertile space, but everything you mentioned, I think are good tools. So Jira, for issue tracking, and then of course, Confluence used to be very popular for and Wiki, any form of Wiki for requirements collaboration. These are all good mm -hmm. great collaboration tools for sure. So let's keep moving um, on the on the another principle to use for long-term success is to not as far as possible exceptions are exceptions as far as possible our advice is 
not to split your scrum teams across the geography boundaries and therefore the time boundaries. So keep this, most of the scrum team, meaning the dev and QA intact in one time zone. Now product owner and product manager role, of course, is a bit of a gray area. So the models that we see in work, you see in the visual on the left, either you have a product manager slash product owner, if it is a small product, you only have, let's say one person who can play both roles, which, which, which is common. They may be in the US time zone and they're working with it with the entire Scrum team in this illustration of four developer, two QA uh, sitting in India. And that works fine. The only thing that happens and should happen and you should encourage is a lead developer or a lead QA plays the role of a proxy product owner. So they come up to speed enough over time on the domain and all that, that they can be the local point person for the team to resolve issues in that time zone on requirements, clarification and, and all that. So that's one model. The other is um, the second picture, which is you have a actual product owner embedded in the remote team. So you have a product manager state site and, pro and then a product owner who is team facing and, and embedded with the team in that same time zone. And then it is a seven person team in this example, of course. So, so that's, these are the two common models, but uh, as far as possible, avoid the urge to have two developer in, in US and two developer in, in India who are part of the same scrum team, it just doesn't work very well. It works, can work, but just not a desirable. So ultimately you should end up with this picture on the right, which we flashed that before in the distributed development that you have in a full scrum team, let's say in, the, in this example in Austin, and let's say the client is in Austin, and then you have another full scrum team in Pune, India, as soon as in this example. And there's a common product manager, wherever they may be, and then, but each scrum team has their own product owner in the local time zone. That model works beautifully. So, but don't split the scrum team. That's the guidance. Hamid, Another, really I, quickly, yeah. um, what, is, what is the difference between the PM and the PO? Yeah, good question. So general, generally accepted kind of a terminology these days in Agile and every many companies do define them differently in their own world. So product manager is typically an external facing product leader who's worrying about the big picture product roadmap and spending most of their, their time working with customers, analysts, and um, you know being close to the market. And then product owner is usually someone a little more technical, more development facing. They're sitting day to day with the team. They may come from the QA or development background and from their history, and they're fully 100% fleshing out so the, the story is an acceptance test and all that working shoulder to shoulder with the dev team, maybe even owning some of the QA um, responsibility. So product owner is more a big product platform may have one product manager who is customer facing and, and external facing and may have multiple two or three product owners if there are two or three scrum teams working on that product. So that's commonly the different uh, the distinction. Okay. Great, so thank that, you. So with that, let's uh, push a little bit more clarity on product manager, product owner, as it comes to remote teams. So I talked about the availability of requirements, granularity in your local team. And if you're, if you're local, and I'm calling your meaning client, product management team is able to provide all the way to the left green, you know, you know not just epics, but also stories and acceptance criteria and acceptance test, even that level of granularity versus in the middle when you're only able to provide epics and stories or all the way to the right where you're only able to provide the high level vision and epics. So in that kind of gradation of how granular the specific requirements you are, the remote team needs to match that ability. So if you're all the way to the left where you're providing that level of granularity, you can pretty easily just have dev and QA in your remote team and, and the model will work very well. On the other hand, if you're in the middle and you're able to provide epics and stories, then you need to have a product owner locally sitting with the team in the local time zone in, in, in this example in India, so that, that uh, they can flesh out acceptance test and all that. On the other hand, if you're all the way to the right, all you're able to provide in your from your local team is a product vision and high level epics, then you need a full product manager as well as a product owner in your remote team. Otherwise you run the risk of getting misunderstanding of the intent. So that's essentially what it boils down to, which is visually kind of mapped here, what you need in your required. So if you're in the red area on the top right kind of a side, 
where the domain familiarity is low and you are not able to provide reasonably uh, granular requirements, then you have to make sure your remote team has all the support of product owner and product manager there locally and other way around. So that's kind of, and then finally on this topic, just make sure whatever as you assemble the team, match the nature of the team that you assemble remotely to the nature of work you want to get done. It's a common, because economics work to your advantage often if your team's in India, it doesn't make sense for you to hire high-end architects just because your budget allows for it while your nature of your work is relatively mundane or you know support and maintenance so just you you would have a high churn in the team so it's commonsensical but i just want to remind the fact that just like you would do locally make sure your nature of your work matches the nature of skills you're bringing on the team and so on so with that let me turn it over to you to share some other ideas um, Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, one of the things that I've found is um, two-way communication, rich two-way communication is very critical. And you know, th luckily, the, the tools have expanded. And what, what I found funny is that a year ago, you know, b prior to COVID hitting and, and at the start of it, when, you know, um, everybody had to start using um, video conferencing of some kind or, you know, collaborations tools like um, the ones pictured here, um, it was kind of a, a mess, right? Because a lot of the people using it, even you know, technical managers, technical leads, hadn't used that before. They've been involved with that, but usually it's a, a salesperson setting up a call with a client or the like. And so um, then you, you take that now, and everybody is somewhat of an expert in, in one or more, and typically more, um, of these tools, which is very interesting to me. Um, but use that. And, and the, what I find is the video capability is, is great. Um, you get to see, you know, putting a face to a voice or a face to a name is uh, often very important. Um, you know, when you meet someone for the first time after talking to them on the phone for several times, it's, it's always kind of funny to to how that picture in your mind differs or is very similar to what you you pictured. But then you then from that point on, you can see that person as you're talking to them on the phone. But you can use now the, the capabilities with video conferencing to do that. And I'm a I'm a big fan of that and enforcing that. What you want to do is get to an environment where the your um, offshore team um, actually your remote team. Let me say that ask questions on on phone calls and and i'll be frank um you know technical people aren't really made they're not wired for that oftentimes and so um even uh us based tech folks and so you know i have to push in when, when i'm doing calls with you know large tech groups to even us based as well as offshore to make sure that i'm asking questions to make people ask you know answer and then they get more comfortable asking questions themselves as well so that's a critical thing you want to make sure that they know what it is that you are you know, trying to make sure they understand the clarity of communication and what you're trying to communicate to them, but also when they have issues, they feel very comfortable to ask you as well. Um, a lot of things that you know, talk about sensitive data and applications, the next slide here, that you know, HIPAA and, and PCI and, and other types of you know, credit card um, um, security and the like, uh, they're often misunderstood. Uh, one of my current clients, for example, is in the healthcare space, and, when I came on board, they were talking about, you know, they had uh, some offshore, a small offshore team, but they couldn't really send everything over there because of quote unquote HIPAA restrictions. And I looked at them and I said, well, can you explain to me what you're talking about? And what they had was a couple of specific clients had some restrictions about sending data offshore, like physically, you know, uh, sending data, a whole data set or a whole database offshore. There really were very minimal or little, um, uh, if any, um, restrictions about having offshore um, teams or offshore resources work on HIPAA requirements. There's none in the HIPAA requirements. So there might've been a couple of specific customer issues, but for the most part, we're okay. So make sure you understand what the rules and the guidelines are. Um, you can have a BAA set up, for example, with an offshore team, just like you have on an onshore team. And the, you know, and they, they're then covered under your umbrella. Just make sure, but also be smart about your data, not just with offshore teams, but with remote people. Make sure they're not doing silly things like um, you know, sending uh, data sets with people's personal information via email. Um, we've had customers send us that stuff. And, you know, that's one of the tools we didn't talk about, but secure mail is, is prevalent now. It's very easy to, to get a, a secure mail set up and you should do that for any kind of sensitive information and make sure that you, you know, the, the sensitive stuff is encrypted or everything is de, um, depersonalized anyway and make sure you do that. So that's a key for us. And Hemet's gonna talk a little bit about the fun piece as we kind of close out here, but uh, that's a big piece as well. I, I'm a big proponent of, you know, I said earlier, you know, having, um, you know, uh, virtual happy hours, having uh, a virtual lunches, lunch and learns and like as well. So Hemet will talk through some of this. 
Yeah, thanks, Kelly. So just to emphasize that point, you know, once you get all the hard work of setting up a remote team and 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 you attend it to the team combination and the tooling and everything we covered today, you know, just have fun with this. You know, there's uh, uh, celebrate the diversity and uh, in the you see pictures of our teams in India, where there's local festivals in their case or um, or cricket matches and all that. We just feel it it makes for such great camaraderie with your uh, team and it is well worth uh, embracing it wholeheartedly. So that's our advice. And here are a few more pictures uh, for how you celebrate with our clients and um, build good software while having fun doing it. So with that, any other questions? I know we're at the top of the hour, just two minutes away, Jill, that we missed taking so far. No, Hamid, just go ahead with the final slides. We, we don't have time for any more questions, but we can follow up an email. Sounds good, sounds good. I'm glad we got a chance to chat about this topic. So all of you in the audience, if you have any questions, let us know, we're happy to answer those. We covered this at a very high level. Um, this is a quick overview of Synergip and Prime. We just help our clients leverage remote teams and, and deliver software with the, uh, you know, with speed and, and, and economics advantage and the scale that they, our clients need. So think of us if you need, here is a representative set of number of our clients, you probably recognize some names across industries and um, various verticals. So that's pretty much it, what we wanted to cover. Um, reach us out if we can be of help to you in getting your remote teams up and running. So back to you, Jill. I just have one quick thing to add. Um, I do wanna add that we have created an ebook for working with remote teams and it was just finalized this morning. So I will send that out tomorrow in the email with a link to this recording but as for that i think we're we did really well thank you everybody for joining us today um, we take your time very seriously so we want to get you back to your regular day thank you kelly and hemet this was great information presented in a, a great conversational manner so easy to understand so thank you everybody thanks thank for you. attending folks appreciate it